guys doing good? Man, who's excited for Christmas? I love Christmas. Do you love Christmas? Such a great time. They're singing our songs. Is my microphone and monitors, or do we have monitors? Why does it sound so bloomy? Does it sound loud to you? Sounds good? Just weird to me? Well, thank you, sir. Can I, can I get some coffee? Some cream, please. Who was cold this morning? I don't get cold, and that was cold. It's like, what's up with that? Oh, weird. We're going to have a good time in the Word this morning. Uh, we're going to be talking about Christmas. The title of the message is Christmas, a reality check. We're going to talk about reality this morning. Sometimes we want to talk about Christmas like the wonderful, ideal. You know, how many people you've seen on TV like the Christmas stories and stuff, and sometimes you come to church and you see like a Christmas presentation, and it's all wonderful, it's so spiritual, it's so awesome, and then you go have Christmas with your family. <laughs> and you're like, huh. some of my craziest memories are at Christmas. And when I say crazy, I'm not talking about good, you know what I mean, Micah? Were you mad dogging me right now? All right, just making sure. So um, I'll tell you a crazy story about my dad. My dad's not like that now. He's saved. Thank you, Jesus. And uh, he has a broken hip right now, so I can say whatever I want to him. He can't catch me. So anyway, I called him on the phone. He's He's out of rehab now, but he had a dream that he was in Vietnam again. And he dove out of his bed to the foxhole, which means he dove out of his bed onto the tile and broke his hip. So yeah, he's all right. So I called him up. He was in rehab, and he's all, you know, jacked up and stuff. And I, he answered the phone. I said, hey, Dad, what are you doing? He said, planning my next move. <laughs> he's crazy, so I'm sure he gave those people a hard time there. But anyway, back before my dad was a Christian, when my family was a little weird-er, I would say weird. It's still weird, but weird-er. Um, I remember one day my aunt, my mom's sister's husband, he's like the nicest guy. You guys have people like that in your family? Like there's the one guy that's like the nicest guy? This is the nicest guy, Uncle Gary. We call him Gary Bob. Gary Bob was sitting in a chair, kicking back, and he was having some pie. Thank you, sir. You're a gentleman and a scholar. And very handsome. And so uh, Gary Bob's sitting in the chair eating some pie, and my dad walks in, and my dad is a very small person. My dad looks at Gary and goes, Gary, you're in my chair. Get up. This is on Christmas, right? And Gary's like, (laughs) <laughs> laughing because surely nobody is that rude and serious about that, except you don't know my dad. So he's like, ha ha, my dad said, I'm gonna count to three, if you're not out of that chair, I'll throw you out of that chair. And Gary's like, ha ha, and my dad decides not to count. How many people know if you're crazy enough to say that, don't count on that person counting to three. My dad grabs him and throws him out of the chair violently. Gary goes flying out of the chair, the pie goes flying, and he lands on the ground on all fours, and he's embarrassed and in shock, like, I can't believe that just happened. Before he can even figure out what's happening, my dad's already sitting back in the chair with his Pepsi, and he's like, I tell nobody sit in my chair, come to my house, try to sit in my chair, I tell you to get up, I don't even care what's Christmas, I throw you out on the ground. And my uncle's like, okay, I don't even know what to do now, I'm on the ground. And it's like, Merry Christmas, welcome to my house. Is that crazy, Louie? Yeah, it's pretty crazy, right? And then people are like, why are you the way you are? I'm a better version of that. (laughs) But my dad's not like that now. My dad's the most loving, kind, wonderful. He'll give you his chair. Not right now because he can't get up. But he'll give you his chair. He doesn't care. He'll get you some. He's a great guy. But we grew up with crazy stuff like that at Christmas, like family doing crazy stuff, you know? And they wondered why I started drinking. It's like, you guys, you guys are my family. It's like as soon as they started having Christmas, I was outside on the patio drinking, trying to deal with them, you know. I was nine. No, I'm just kidding. I made that part up. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You guys are like, wow, this is a depressing Christmas. But our family had all kinds of issues, you know, and stuff. And I remember when I was having a hard time with my family, even when I was older, one of my family members emailed me and told me, you're the one that's been ruining Christmas. And I was like, Ugh. again, I was nine. <laughs> but Christmas is hard because when you get your whole family together, right? You get your fa- How many people, when you think of getting your family together, it sounds awesome, right? And then there's the reality of it. So here's the deal. It, it is awesome. 
but it also brings up wounds and hurts from the past and sometimes unforgiveness and it, it instigates those things. Sometimes we see our family for a little while, you're like, huh, long enough, see you next year, Merry Christmas, right? But the reality, we, we have to think about the reality of why Christ came into the world and what Christmas is really about. And then sometimes I think we set ourselves up to fail when we think about Christmas. We, we expect it to be something that it's not gonna be. It's not that we shouldn't have hope for our family or we shouldn't enjoy our family or think that we should have a good time, but we also, I think, we put unfair expectations on other people and then we get disappointed because it's not what we thought it was gonna be. You know what it's gonna be? It's gonna be a bunch of people getting together that are in your family, that love each other and people that have loved each other also have hurt each other, different personalities. We're all gonna get together and try to hang out and have some food, spend some time together and it's gonna be awesome and a little crazy, Right? They're probably not going to make a TV show about it. So I think a lot of times the reason that we, we get disappointed is because we, we set up an unfair, or unrealistic ideal that everyone should live up to to make our Christmas perfect. That day is called your birthday, not Jesus' birthday. We're all sharing it. You don't have a rule on my birthday. On my birthday, I do whatever I want with whoever I want, and nobody tells me anything, and I don't care. It's a rule that I have, right? Annie participates. She just, like, brings me food and things. She's like, it's your birthday. I'm like, heck, yeah, it is. <laughs> Next year, I turn 50, and when I turn 50, I'm not having birthday. I'm having birth month. Just so you know, you will not see me for a month. I will be gone. I will do whatever I want for one month. You're going to have to make it on your own. I will pray for you before I leave. I'll pray for you when I get back. You got 30 days to make it on your own because I will be as selfish as I can. I will gain weight in those 30 days, I promise. <laughs> I will eat. There's nothing after that because it will be everything. I will just eat for 30 days. I will watch TV. Anyway, back to Christmas. Who wants to have a great Christmas? Yeah. Then deal with the reality, right? Right? In Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 7, we read these verses, and they sound so wonderful. Listen how wonderful they sound. Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Doesn't that sound good? You know what that means? Everybody was getting taxed, and they want to know where everybody lived, so they made you go where you came from to register so they could get your money. Imagine the IRS saying, not only are you paying taxes, you're going to go over here to this city with your whole family, and then you're going to pay your taxes. See, that's not that wonderful, right? It sounds better when we don't know what it means. Oh, yeah, census. Oh, wonderful. Listen what happens. It says, Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, see how nice this is, who was engaged to him. See, they were engaged and pregnant. 2017. No, that's not true. They don't get married till after four kids. And was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no, no room for them in the inn. See how wonderful that story is? It sounds nice, right? Except for we're going to get to the reality of that story because it's not that nice. When we have Christmas today, it's a lot different than the first Christmas. You know, we go to our house, we have presents, and we're baking, and it's wonderful, and it's warm. We don't go look for a cave to hang out with some animals, right? Unless that's what your Christmas is like with your family, right? You're like, it is. It's like a cave with animals. <laughs> but the manger scene usually, um, when we make a manger scene, it includes angels hovering and shepherds watching and animals gazing and, and clean straw and Joseph there and and the invincible little baby, a halo over Mary's head, the moon is rising, everything's perfect. We make the manger scene, and it's all beautiful and wonderful because we have romanticized it. Do you understand what a romantic view is? Some people, we're not talking about love, although it definitely applies to that. A romantic view is when you have an idea of something, of how wonderful it is without factoring in the reality. The romantic view is the emotional view of how wonderful it could be. Now we're back to talking about your family at Christmas. We have a romantic idea that we're all going to get around and hold hands and talk about how good Jesus has been to us this year. And probably there's a good chance somebody's going to be arguing. 
How many people know that's a reality? Okay, maybe you didn't grow up with your dad throwing your uncle out of the chair on Christmas. I did. We had a different reality. But back then, that first Christmas, it was anything except perfect. Let's look at the story in, in the reality version, okay? Mary is non-married. She's pregnant. She's probably young. Scholars believe 12 or 13 years old. Different times. Um, and she's engaged to Joseph, who's totally devastated because she's pregnant. He's not the dad. How many people know that changes Christmas right there? They had to walk from Nazareth to Bethlehem, and that's about 50 miles. Some people are like, I haven't walked 50 miles in 50 years. And they were going for an awesome reason, right? Celebrate Christmas or to pay taxes. Have you ever been to the IRS building? I got audited by the IRS. I, I went there. It was wonderful. It was so much fun. We did it again. We did two years. But I went there, and when I got there, there's a metal detector, and it says no weapons. I was like, ah, that's funny. Five minutes after being in there, I was like, I wish I had my gun. I know why they got that metal detector out there, because people will be getting shot up inside this building. Ain't nobody. Do you, when you fill out your taxes, are you happy? Unless you don't work, and, you're, you know, and then you're getting money back, and I don't know how that works, but some people apparently enjoy that. I don't enjoy it. But here he is taking his young fiance who's pregnant on a 50-mile journey to pay taxes. And what a wonderful Christmas, isn't it? And then do you know anybody that's nine months pregnant? Ladies that have had kids, how wonderful is it when you're nine months pregnant? Now remember, you're angry. <laughs> that's a good point. But when you're nine months, now remember, Mary had the baby right after they got there. So she wasn't just nine months pregnant. You know how women look when the stomach looks like a torpedo? You know the baby's coming out one way or the other. It's coming out, right? Now she's traveling 50 miles, riding on a donkey. Have you ever watched a pregnant woman get out of a car? <laughs> like, that's a process right there, right? She's riding on a donkey. Now, donkeys... It's worse than a stick shift. It's not just the shifting. You're on a donkey. <laughs> Have you ever watched a pregnant woman try to get comfortable on a comfortable couch with 19 pillows and a blanket? It's not possible. Can you imagine the mood she was in on that donkey? Merry Christmas. Joseph is like, here, I'm taking this chick. She's pregnant. I don't know who the dad is. She's riding on the donkey, complaining the whole time. And when I get there, woo, I'm paying taxes. Pregnant and perhaps a little cranky. Mary wasn't perfect. She was just special, like us. Tell the person next to you, you're special. <laughs> Joseph forgot to call ahead and make reservations. They were homeless for the night, and they ended up in a barnyard, some type of cave where Mary painfully goes into labor. How many moms? Raise your hand. Moms, raise your hand. How many men have been there when a woman has given birth? Okay. How many people were born? No, just kidding. <laughs> okay. There's nothing romantic about birth. It's spiritual. It's wonderful. It's emotional at the end. But during, it is horrific. I remember every time one of my four kids was born, I longed for the old days where the men were in a bar across the street waiting to hear how it turned out. <laughs> I was like, I do not want to be right here watching this happen right now. You know, it's not, how many people know it's not a wonderful, you know, it's fresh, very fresh. This message is speaking to you guys right now. You're like, we're hearing you. We're dialed in by the Holy Ghost, right? You're like, I don't need to hear this. I could teach it. That's the first Christmas it has to do with a birth. That's not what you think about is, wow, what fun. Because we're like, and then she gave birth to a baby in a manger. Then she had a baby with no epidural, no narcotics. I remember my kid was being born and they gave her narcotics. I was like, what do you got for me? <laughs> in a barnyard. 
throwing down some blankets, trying to make it as clean as you can. And then the baby's born. And there's nowhere to put the baby, so they go to the feeding trough where the, guys, come on. Think about that. They put blankets in there to make it kind of, and then they're like, look, the baby fits in here. You're not talking about they were at this nice birthing center or they had a midwife come to the house, traveling by donkey and walking 50 miles and popping out a kid in a barnyard. That's the first Christmas. Not as romantic as it sounds, the wonderful manger scenes, right? And then because King Herod, remember we talked about that last week, was crazy and was killing all these kids, they had to become fugitives with toddler Jesus in Egypt. How many people know that's not like running down to Cancun for a weekend? (laughs) Right? It's like, I've been out of the country, I've been to Cancun. It's like, doesn't count. You've been to American Cancun. <laughs> they ended up in Egypt with a toddler. That's what the first Christmas result. These are, these are realities, right? So we have two pictures, one that glamorizes Christmas, Christmas and the other one's a reality check. And you know what? Life is like that sometimes, all the time. Life is like that all the time. How many married people do we have? Married people, yep. Life is like that when you get married. When you're growing up, you think, man, I have a dream, boys. Every boy's going to be a professional athlete, right? You know how they tell you, you can be whatever you want. I'm 5'7". There's a lot of things I can't be. <laughs> it's like, you can be in the NBA. Nope. You can be president. <laughs> Born in the wrong family. Not going to happen. How many people know you cannot be whatever you want? You can be whatever God wants you to be. How many people know that's right? But we think, I'm going to be a professional athlete. I'm going to be a pilot. I'm, I'm going to invent something. I'm going to make a lot of money. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And then reality sets in. And it's like these kids in college like, I'm going to get out of college. I'm going to make $200,000 a year. I'm going to be in charge of nothing. You'll be a bartender in Scottsdale. <laughs> it's like, I graduated. Where's my job? And everybody with a job goes, <laughs> it doesn't work like that. You notice there's nobody, there's no job scouts Here's, here's a reality check for everybody in college, which I support you going to college. You should go to college, especially if you're young, go to college. Go while you're young and you don't know what you're gonna do. Get your degree out of your way. Or you can be like the people at Destiny. They wait till they have nine kids and then they go to college later and then everybody has to suffer while you go to college. If you wanna do that, go ahead. That's the way we do it. But if you wanna be smart, go when you're younger and you don't know what you're doing. You like that, Louie? This is a reality check. Christmas reality check. But you'll never see job scouts Job hunters, like, looking for awesome people at a college graduation. (laughs) There's no place where they're signing up. Man, I saw you got good grades. We want to give you a job. That's not real life. Now, if if you are in a career that requires you to get a degree, then that's what you need to do. That's reality. But nobody's waiting for you to give you anything. And then you think, I'm going to get married. This will be a perfect woman. It's going to be wonderful. And then you marry her, and you find out she's not perfect. And neither are you. And then you find out that marriage is work. And you think, I'm going to have a happy family. It's going to be wonderful. And then you have disappointments and divorce and disrespect from kids. Man, I grew up, my mom, it was on automatic. It didn't matter what. My mom should have been a boxer. She can hit you from any angle, any position with no warning. There were never faints, though, with my mom. My mom didn't fake. If she moved, you got smacked. But anytime I opened my mouth and I said something smart, smart to my mom, if I talked back, it was like, bam, right in the face. And it was like, whoa, what is going on? But I learned, hey, when I say smart things, I get slapped in the face. I don't like getting slapped in the face. I'm going to stop saying those things. How many people know it works like that? But, you know, kids are a little slow. You got to train them almost like dogs repeatedly and consistently, and then they go, connection made, right? It's like there's a connection of respect in their brain that only makes the connection when you spank them. It's like that connection doesn't get made until you hit that rebellious button, until you make that connection. It's like, oh, consequences are related to my actions. How many people know that's right? So you think family's going to be wonderful. People think that I was going to get married, have a little house, and a white picket fence, some wonderful kids, and a wife, and then reality sets in. Nobody comes and does your dishes. 
You have to do them, right? I, there's guys that are like, man, I want to come home to a clean house and dinner prepared. And it's like, cool. Does your wife work? Yeah. She wants to come home to that too. Now, if you don't work, get your butt up and clean the house and make some food because that's your freaking job. Let me throw that out there because if you ain't bringing the money, you better get to work, honey. Let me talking about he needs to do his share. He did. He brought home the check. You do your chair, your share. Oh, I said it in Spanish. <laughs> do your chair. Yeah, do your chair. Not only clean the house and cook dinner, take a shower and put on some makeup. Find something sexy to put on. Come on, somebody. There we are getting back to the romantic viewpoint again. But we have this idea, and sometimes our romantic idea sets us up to fail. What we need to do is understand there's a reality involved in everything. It's not wrong that we have a picture of it, but there's a reality involved. And let's, let's you know, this is the way it should be. Everybody hates when I say this. This is the way that it should be, and this is the way it is. Our goal isn't to complain that it's not the way it should be. Our goal is to make it closer to the way it should be. I, I'm part of the solution, right? Well, this might be where it is, but I'm not okay with that. I think we can make it better and get it closer to the way it should be. That's reality, right? When you go to Christmas with your family, maybe it's gonna be a little crazy. Instead of getting mad and saying everybody's not doing what they should be doing, maybe you could come in and bring some love, bring the presence of God, encourage people, make it a little closer to what it could be. Maybe you're the solution, right? Maybe you're the person that can make it better. You can inspire somebody, amen? All right, that's my intro. Six points. Number one, oh, Lord Jesus, help us. We'll go fast. God gets involved in the lives of people who listen to him. Say listen. listen. How many people want God involved in your life? Yeah. Guess what you have to do? Listen. Let's try again. How many people want God involved in your life? Listen. Guess what you have to do? Listen. Boom, there it is. Point number two. No, just kidding. Joseph and Mary were engaged to be married. Luke chapter one. God sent an angel to Mary, Mary, and, he, and she, he said something like this. Guess what? You're going to get pregnant before you get married. And she said, guess what? No, I'm not. And the angel said, guess what? Yes, you are. She says, guess what? I'm not doing what it takes. And the angel says, guess what? You don't have to. You're going to get pregnant, and you're still going to be a virgin when, she get, when you get married. She goes, all right, now you got my attention. How many people know that'll trip you out? It's funny because people that are not having sex are getting pregnant today still. That's probably not Christmas sermon material, but Lord Jesus. How many people know it's hard to deny it at that point? And then how many people know what the answer is then? Well, we did it one time. Mm hmm You sure did. She tried to understand what the angel was, was saying, and he spoke again. He said, Mary, listen to me. You have a heart for God. He's decided to show his favor for you in a special way. He's chosen you for an incredible miracle. In a short time, you will be miraculously and instantly pregnant with the Son of God who will save his people from their sins. How many people know for Mary to allow God to get involved in her life, she had to listen. She, she listened to what the angel of the Lord was saying, right? And if you want God to be involved in your life, guess what needs to happen? You have to listen. How are we listening? You don't have to listen to angels. You listen to the word of God. Amen. Listen to what God is saying to you in his word. When you listen, it's because he's trying to get involved in your life. I was talking about kids earlier. I was talking to our kids and, and I said, look, when you're rebellious, I, I'm not correcting you because you're bothering me. I'm correcting you because you're destroying you. You, you don't see, I can see what happens with that attitude 10 years from now. You can't see it. I've seen it in my life and in other people's lives. I'm not, I'm not trying to get you to do what I want. I'm trying to get you to do what the Bible says. If you'll listen to what the Bible says, your life will be better because God wants to be involved in your life. But if you want him to be involved in your life, you have to listen. Amen? Yeah. And then the cool thing is that, uh, you know, you look, at, you look at Joseph. How many people know you're, you're getting ready to get engaged, Right? They're in the process of being engaged. And then she says, guess what? I'm pregnant. How many people know it's like, later? <laughs> right? Remember, we don't know the end of the story. He didn't know the end of the story. It's like, I'm pregnant. Really? It was God. <laughs> okay. 
you and God go raise that kid because I'm out. Wouldn't you say that? And then because God is awesome, he gives Joseph a dream, speaks to him and explains to him. And it's a miracle because the angel tells Joseph exactly what's going on. And Joseph listens and signs up for the program. How cool is that? God got involved in Mary's life because she listened. The Lord got involved in Joseph's life because he listened. He could have removed himself. He could have left. Who could blame him? Even God probably would have cut him some slack. Come on, somebody. But he didn't. He listened, and the Lord got involved in his life. When we listen to God and we accept his truth, he can do miracles in us and through us. Amen? If we'll do that, there's no limit to what God can do in us. Number two, God will go to great lengths to see that his will is done when we cooperate with him. How many people want God's will done in your life? What do you have to do? I, I put it all in caps. How many, how many people want God's will done in your life? Guess what you have to do? Hint. How many people want God involved in your life? What do you have to do? Okay, we're going to get it. You want God involved in your life? What do you have to do? You want God's will in your life? What do you have to do? Cooperate. Because he's not going to make you. Right? It was prophesied, check this out, it was prophesied in the Old Testament that Bethlehem would be the birthplace of Christ. So when you think about this couple, now she's miraculously pregnant. He's miraculously on board, and it's like, how do we get them 50 miles away so she can have the baby in the city that it was prophesied? Then all we have to do is create circumstances and situations to get them in the will of God. Did you get that? Some of the situa situations and circumstances that you're facing are not the devil. They're God putting you in the right place at the right time so you can be in his will. Sometimes we're mad, we're rebuking the devil, and the devil's like, wasn't even me. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. And Jesus says, you can't rebuke me in my name. I created those circumstances to get you right where I wanted you so that my will could be done in your life. God coordinated events to make sure that it happened. The people that were involved, the angelic announcements, the exact timing in the birth, and the government even made a law so that the people would have to be, so that they would have to travel and be there. Since so, God's so good at coordinating history and events that affects people's lives for good, what is it that he wants to coordinate in your life that will bring about good? Things change and we get mad. Now look, I, I'm just, just being me, okay? I'm not saying you would be like this. All right, God, my girlfriend's pregnant. We're supposed to get married. She's pregnant. She says it was you. You said it was you. I got it. I'm cool. I'll stay with her. Now you want me to take her pregnant and you want me to go pay taxes? I don't know about you, but sometimes I get mad when things like that happen in my life. Have you ever went out to your car and it has a flat tire? And you were like, praise the Lord. He's probably getting me in the right place for his will. Well, let's go ahead and take your attitude when you see that flat tire. And let's go ahead and multiply that times a thousand to take your unmarried pregnant girlfriend 50 miles to go pay taxes. In case you can't really connect to it. <laughs> When bad things happen that we see as a, as a hindrance or an inconvenience or an interruption, a lot of times God is using to put you in the right place so that his will will be done in your life. So what we need to do is we need to stop fighting and we need to start cooperating. Okay, this is happening. God, you must have a plan for me to be where I'm at and what's going on now. Let's do what you want us to do. See, that's cooperating, amen? Trust and submit our thoughts and our plans to God, and then he can do amazing things through you. Number three, God wants to relate to all types of people, and he will use them if they respond to him, right? God wants to relate to you. How many people want God to relate to you? Four of you. How many people want God to relate to you? Guess what you have to do? If you didn't respond, you missed this point. Whatever, <laughs> man. God wants to use you. He wants to relate to you. But you need to respond. The shepherds, you know, we see the story of the shepherds, and, and I don't know, I, I grew up in Yuma. There's a lot, huge agriculture in Yuma. The farmers in Yuma, we don't think of, as farmers as poor people. 
Because where we live, the farmers are rich. <laughs> like they're rolling around their giant Ford truck that costs more than my house. They play golf in red wing boots, you know. That's how they are. The farmers got money where we live. But the, at this time, the shepherds, they were like lower middle class. They didn't have money. Also, they were such a, of such a lower class that they weren't even allowed to testify in court. Because there were different classes of people, right? These guys were not even allowed to testify in court against somebody because they didn't really count. But look what happens. God chose to invite the shepherds to go and see Jesus before anybody else. Isn't that cool? Isn't that how awesome God is? The Bible says he's no respecter of persons. God didn't need to come through the temple. He didn't need to come through the Pharisees. He didn't have to come through the high priest. He didn't have to come through the rich people. He didn't have to come through the kings and the governors. He just went and the angels told the shepherds, hey, Jesus is going to be born. It's going to be right over here. They're the first ones that were told. God can relate to anyone. But then guess what? God also told the three kings. Remember, we just talked about them, the wise men. He, he spoke to them, and he brought people that, that understood spiritual things. But also, these guys were influential people, obviously wealthy people. They brought rich gifts to come and see the Christ. Different levels of people. God will relate to you if you'll respond to him. He wants to relate to you with wherever you're at. Sometimes we feel like we're not important. But Jesus came to people that people didn't think were important. Look at Mary. She was nobody. She was just a young girl. She wasn't anyone that anybody would think was special. But God said that she was special and highly favored. Sometimes we don't think we're, we're valuable, but God thinks you're valuable. And if you'll respond, guess what? He'll relate to you. But you need to respond. What would happen if you got a check for $200? If somebody gave you a check today for $200, would you be happy? Would you like that? What if they give you a pen and said, if you want, go ahead and add a zero in the end? How many people know $2,000 is a little bit different, right? It's the same check, just another zero. But you could do some things with $2,000, right? That's what God does. He already made us with value. But when you respond and he relates to you, he adds value to your life. He, he takes something that he already made that was valuable and he says, I'm going to make you more valuable. I'm going to make you better. But you know what? You have to respond to God. These things are important because these are practical things about the Christmas. You have to remember, Christ did not come for a celebration. He didn't come so we could build manger scenes and have special Christmas services at church, which we're going to because we love it. It's a great time of celebration of the season. But Christ came into the world in a very real way to people just like me and you so that he could affect and change our real lives and rescue us from our real sins. Not so he could be a celebration or something that we, we put off in a manger scene or on a Christmas card. He wants to deal with your real hurts, your real pains, your real brokenness. He wants to deal with your family, with the way it really is, but he also wants to deal with your real hopes and your real dreams and show you your real value. Amen? Number four. See, we're flying. We're almost done. God's looking for men, you can put in parentheses, or women, I guess. God's looking for men who will provide protection to their family members. God's looking for, for men who will provide protection for their family members. Joseph was a carpenter, which means he has many skills that I do not possess. Anyone who's ever tried to work with me knows that me and tools are not related. I don't know why. My brother was a helicopter mechanic, and I can't open a bag of chips. <laughs> I have sausage fingers. I was on a plane one time, and you know how they give those little tiny bags of chips? I was trying to open the chips, and I was trying to be gentle with it because I don't <clears throat> go like that, you know? And I'm, like, trying, and I'm trying to be patient. Inside, I'm raging, right? <laughs> and I'm just like, I got this, I got this. And this older lady sitting next to me, she reaches over, takes the chips from me, opens them up, and hands them back, and just looks straight. I don't think she did that for me. I think she didn't want the chips on her. She knew what was going to happen. I don't have skills. I was trying to fix something on my motorcycle one time. I was just putting this little thing on there, and I couldn't get the wrench, and I was trying, and it wouldn't go, and my brother says, here, let me do it. I'm like, stop, it's my project. 
I'm like trying and trying and trying and trying and trying. How many people know when your patience runs out, you're not doing better, you're actually doing worse, right? It's hard to put a little tiny set screw in something when you're like this, like losing your mind. And my brother goes, like gently, just like the lady grabbing the chips. And he goes, here, here, let, just let me. And he licks it and he puts it in the dirt and he goes, there you go, and hands it back to me. I've been working on it 30 minutes. I killed my brother. God said, where's your brother? I said, am I my brother's keeper? I don't know what to tell you. But Joseph was a carpenter, and he was Jesus' cool influencer married to his mom, I guess. <laughs> it's hard to call him his dad, right? He's like, I got a father, bud, and you ain't it. But he was a regular guy in some pretty irregular circumstances. <laughs> Had to be rough being him, right? But he's a regular guy, lower middle class. He's a man who understood the value of looking out for his family. And the cool thing is the Bible talks about that when the Lord spoke to him about Mary, he loved her. And he knew that if he put her away, she would be shamed. And he chose, not even really understanding, to cover and to protect her. God's looking for people like that. It didn't mean the situation was perfect. Actually, the situation was perfect. His understanding of the situation was imperfect. That would be theologically correct. But in his mind, it was completely imperfect, messed up. Let's say it like this. Everything got screwed up. If we're getting married, it's wonderful. You're pregnant. What's up? But he decided he loved her enough to take care of her and cover her and protect her because he didn't want to make her ashamed. And then even though Jesus wasn't his son, he took him into Egypt and protected him and raised him and trained him. Isn't that awesome? God's looking for people like that. If you want the Lord to use you and your family, choose to be a parent who will provide protection when life or your children go wrong. How many people know those things are related? Sometimes life and your children go wrong. It's funny because my kids are older, you know, 23, 21, 19, 14, and then, or 15. And Annie's boys are 14 and 12, right? So this is a whole pile of kids, different ages. But it's cute when your kids are small and they're like quoting Bible verses. Yeah. You're like, man, parenting is fun. And I'm like, oh my God, you have no idea what is waiting for you. <laughs> Because that's the reality, right? But here's another thing. You can't look at life and go, there's no hope. There's no, what's the sense? Because it's not true. Because the Bible says, train a child in the way they should go. And when they're old, they'll not depart from it. Which doesn't mean they'll never do anything wrong. But it always means they know their way home. And what you put in them will always come out of them. What you put in them in that season, they're going to reap the rest of their lives. Never give up faith, never give up hope. And you know what? You have to make up your mind. No matter what my kids do, no matter where they go, I will always love them and try to bring them back to the way. No, I'll never give up. I'll keep bringing them. I'll keep loving them. I'll keep reaching out. I'll always tell them what's right, but I'll always love and protect and try to teach my kids. You know why? Because God does that with us. So at Christmas time, maybe you have some wayward kids that are coming home. That's not the time to preach them into the ground. That's the time to love them. You can remind them. We had Thanksgiving. We had a great time. All my kids were there. And I pulled one of my kids aside afterward. I love you. I'm proud of you. But I need you to do this and this and this because that's what the Bible says and it's right. And they said, thank you, Dad, for telling me that. I love you. Hug me. They need to know that. But I didn't beat them up all through Thanksgiving dinner. Are you here? I know this isn't fun Christmas. Next week's going to be fun Christmas. Today's reality check. But we need to reach out. We need to love them and never give up, right? If you're going to be the parent that God wants you to be, you're always protecting, always trying to take care of your kids. Number five, God is God to all mankind. Jesus can be Savior to everyone who calls on his name. God is God to all mankind. Everybody. God is God. Remember we talked about last week the three wise men or the three wise guys, the three, 
the three pagans, the sorcerers, the magicians, the ones who didn't know the real and living God, but they responded. Remember we talked about that? They responded. They listened. They responded. They cooperated. And what happened? How many people know they got saved? How you can't read that story and think they did not get saved. That does not make any sense at all. They came from where they were, everything they knew, and they were like, this is the one. And the Bible says they worshiped him. How many people know they got saved? It doesn't matter who anybody is. It doesn't matter where they're at. You can be saved. Every one of us can be saved. Every person that you know can be saved. It doesn't matter how evil they are. I had a guy tell me one time, he said, don't waste your time with anybody in the hell's angels. They can't be saved because they made a pact and sold their soul to the devil. And I said, I disagree. And I said, you also cannot sell or give away your soul because it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to Jesus. You can either surrender to him or not surrender to him. That's up to you. And I said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord can be saved. Romans 10, 13. What's up? The Bible disagrees with your sucky theology. Everybody can be saved. And God wants all to be saved. Right? And it doesn't matter where you're at today. You can be saved. And if you are saved and you're not doing good, you can start doing good. All you got to do is repent because we call on the name of the Lord. He forgives us. We're back in. He, he's a better parent to us than we could ever be, even to our kids. Amen? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. That's a reality check, especially when people are saying happy holidays. It ain't happy holidays. It's Merry Christmas. Somebody wrote on Facebook, I think Sherry, where's Sherry? There you are. I think Sherry commented, but she said, what would Christmas be without Christ? And somebody put, miss. M-A-S. That was an awesome, but it's so witty. I like your sister. Yeah, that's good stuff. What would Christmas be without Christ? M-A-S. Mas. <laughs> Thank you for the Spanish lesson. <laughs> no mas. <laughs> but... <laughs> But it's not happy holidays. We're not celebrating any other gods. We're not new age. We're not Christian Scientology. It's all about Jesus. Jesus was born into the world, right? That's the celebration of Christmas is. And if you don't like our holiday, get up off it. Make your own holiday. You know what I mean? Call it, call it something else. I don't know. Make up your own deal, but stop trying to hijack Christmas. We are celebrating Christ coming into the world for our broken selves and our broken Families that are not a romantic view, it's a realistic, but Jesus came to save me and my family. So get up off my holiday, or I'm going to give you a Christmas reality check in the form of praying for you because. God can overcome all kinds of problems. How many people know that's right? He can overcome all kinds of trials and unfair circumstances. Man, those unfair circumstances, I think they're the ones that mess us up the most. Because we're like, that's not right. That should not have, yeah, but that's, it happens to everybody. Right? How many people know it wasn't fair that they crucified Jesus? I'm so glad that he didn't say, this isn't fair. It's not what I deserve. He took what we deserve. You know, we're going to be all right. You know why? Because Christ is with us. We can make it through everything. Hey, you can make it. You can make it. Whatever you're going through, you can make it. You're going to make it. Matter of fact, I'm going to prophesy over you right now. You're going to make it, and you're going to make it with a better attitude. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Joseph and Mary and the baby Jesus had to run for their lives into Egypt because of Herod, because he's killing babies. How many people know that's not fair? But it's where God wanted them so it could fulfill the scriptures. It was a terrible time. Can you imagine being a family on the run, hiding, looking over your shoulder? But you know what they did? They prayed for God's protection. They depended on and trusted their heavenly father. And they submitted themselves again to God's will. Did you get that word again? Did anybody hear that? How many people know you don't just submit to God's will one time? You need to submit to God's will as much as you need to go to the cross and crucify your old flesh. How many people know that's every day? Every day you got to sign up for God's will. Not my will but your will be done. Amen? And that's what they did, even in sucky situations. Guys, come on. Let's just give in to the will of God and say, devil, you're going to be sorry that I ended up in this situation because Jesus is with me, his hand is on my life, and I'm going to be a blessing to somebody. God has a plan for me. I'm not going through this for nothing, and I'm going to bring the presence of God in the middle of this situation. Amen? 
Come on, we can be the solution for somebody else. What's the next point? Did you already put it up there? Because I forgot to read it. Yeah. Did you guys already get that? Okay, good. Because I just went on to the next point. I was got excited. God can overcome all your problems, trials, and circumstances. He can do it in your life. He's doing it in mine. He's never going to give up on us. And you know what? Christmas may not ever be the manger scene, you know? But it can be closer to the real deal. In the middle of a crazy world, in crazy times, Christ came to rescue us from our sins, and he's still doing it. Amen? So Jesus grew up in Israel, spoke spiritual truth to those who would listen. He died on the cross for our sins so we could be forgiven. He was resurrected so that we could have the power and the ability to live the way that God wants us to live. So God is committed to a reality check. How many people know we serve a real God? It's not just a... It's not just a religion to make us feel good. We, we have a real living God that's involved in our lives that can help us in our real situations. He can relate in the toughest times. He can give you hope and failure. He can change your life so that it becomes something. He can give you a clear purpose and make a life worth living. Amen? So this year, let's take the romantic view of Christmas. Okay, I'm not saying, I'm not saying don't, don't dream of a great Christmas with your family or whatever you're doing for Christmas. I'm just saying... Let's make it a little bit more realistic. Let's know how, I know this doesn't sound exciting. Let's know how it really is. And then let's try to go into that as a part of God's will to be a blessing to our family, to make it better. Amen? So you don't get that email like I got. You ruined Christmas. Now I am like Jesus' blessing to my family on Christmas. That might have been a lie. No, but I love Christmas, and I love real life and what Christ is doing better than I love pretending for the sake of the holidays. It's better just to let it be what it is and to love people, because we can do it. It's harder, right? It's like church. It's easier to go to church, act spiritual and leave than it is to go and go, well, here's where I'm really at. Jesus, what can you do with me? And then change. But it's better, right? You know why? Because when we do that, things change. Same with our families at Christmas. Be honest. Go in there. Be loving. Be a blessing to your family at Christmas. Make it better. Make it the best Christmas ever. As far as you're concerned, you can't control anybody else, but you can control you. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Bring the light that goes into the family and be a blessing. You can have a great Christmas. It could be the best Christmas ever. And it could be the beginning of people in your family that don't know the Lord being saved. Amen? Amen? And that's the greatest Christmas present. All right, come on, let's be standing together. Father, thank you this morning for your word and, and thank you for your presence. And, and we're so thankful for a Christmas season that we could celebrate together with our families. And Lord, we, we love the holidays. We, we enjoy celebrating this time. And Lord, we don't want to take away from from the celebration. We don't want to take away the joy that we have. And, but Lord, at the same time, we don't, we don't want to pretend that things are different than they are. We want to be people that bring you, Lord, a real Savior that really cares into the middle of our families. Because we know that you can minister life and bring healing and hope to every one of our family members and to us. Lord, maybe today we're, we're in situations where we have unforgiveness towards family members. Lord, pour out your spirit on us and, and empower us by your grace, Lord, to forgive any wrongs or perceived wrongs that we would just release them. Lord, we ask you to forgive our family members and those that have hurt us and disappointed us. Lord, let your blood wash over them. We ask for forgiveness. Lord, we ask you to forgive us for, for what we've done to, to hurt other family members and friends and and Lord, that this Christmas that we could really go in with a heart to serve, to love, and to give to our families, that we would be a blessing. And I speak that over every person in this place right now, that wherever we're at at Christmas, that no matter who we're around, whether it's family or friends or people that we don't know, that we would be a blessing to everyone that's around us in the name of Jesus. Come on, receive that right now. You are going to be a blessing 
this Christmas to the people that are around you. You're going to give a word of hope. You're going to give somebody a hug. You're going to pray for somebody. You're going to encourage someone. You're going to be a blessing to somebody at Christmas. Instead, You know what? It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And God is going to use you to give hope and love this Christmas to somebody else. Lord, let us be the answer, the beginning of the answer to their problems. And that you would come in and save them and rescue them. We speak joy and peace over our families and our friends. And in Jesus' name, amen.